Okay, class, let's uh, go ahead and get rolling today. Um, have the schedule up in front of you and you see this is uh, November 24th. And so we just have two more classes. We have uh, December 1 and December 3. And then the final exam on the 7th, it will be online. Um, I've been making a few problems. I got a bunch of work to do to get that together for you, but I would expect, I would expect probably 15, you know, small problems, a piece of this, a piece of that, that sort of thing. It may be more or less, but um, I would probably expect 15, something like that. Certainly no more than 20, probably not that many. That's about all I know. I've only got two or three made right now, so, okay. So let's jump to the PowerPoint and I think hey, it's been a little while and uh, we hit this kind of quick and it was kind of late and I was kind of sleepy. So <laughs> no telling what I told you all, <laughs> you know, it happens. Uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna give the whole lecture but I'm gonna hit the high points going through this, just, just kind of get our mind right. Cause, and I think we have time. Uh, there's not all that much uh, stuff and okay. Um, so here's a, a typical <clears throat> vapor compression cycle, okay, and it's, you know, instead of, we're kind of going around the other direction, I guess, um, in, in terms of, say, a, a Rankine cycle, maybe that's one way to think about it, but anyway, so, you know, if, if it's a refrigeration, we're running it in order to get Q in. This is being transferred in from like a house or it could be a refrigerator, it could be a freezer, but it's, it's a cool space that we want to keep cool. And so the whole purpose of running this thing is for Q dot in right here to keep your house cool. So you can think about this as, uh, you know, uh, return air from your house blowing across your uh, air conditioning evaporator coil that then gets cold. This is, this for typical air conditioning, this is typically 55, 56, 57 degrees gets blown in your house and feels nice when it's hot outside. Uh, evaporator does just that. It evaporates mostly liquid refrigerant at low pressure. Low pressure means low temperature and we simply evaporate it away to the vapor state. So we may be saturated or superheated over here. We sure don't wanna have any droplets that would hurt the compressor. And then we're gonna compress up to the high pressure. So this is gonna be uh, typically superheated uh, at, at the, uh, the high end pressure. That's how we establish the high pressure <clears throat> is how high the compressor pumps it up to. And then it's a vapor coming out of here. It has to be for the compressor to operate. And then we have to condense it to the liquid state. So this is pretty warm. This could be 150, 175 degrees. So we don't have any trouble transferring heat to the outside. So some units have two two boxes, one inside, one outside, some all set outside, but uh, this is your condenser coil and it's pretty hot. You probably don't wanna put your hand on it. Uh, it probably burn you. Um, and so we just blow ambient air across there and we blow that heat away. And so we then condense to a high pressure, fairly high temperature liquid. And then we drop pressure through an expansion valve, constant enthalpy and dropping that pressure a little bit of the liquid flashes, it goes into the vapor state and that cools the entire flow. And it's, you know, that's what makes a good refrigerant. When I drop pressure at constant enthalpy, it gets cold. And so this is the cold temperature in the cycle. You know, for a typical refrigerator, it's probably 37, 38 degrees, something like that. Uh, most of it's liquid, a little bit vapor, maybe 5% vapor, the rest liquid, and it comes into the evaporator where it boils off again and around and around we go. So that's basically what's going on in the cycle. Okay, and so he's gonna show you all the little processes here. That's the evaporator. So I've kind of talked through all that, so. And then the compressor, uh, and then the condenser, and then the expansion valve. Mm. Okay, we can get past that. Okay, so, you know, we typically do steady state on this stuff. Um, dry compression is presumed. 
So, so we don't tear up the compressor and we don't want any droplets in it going in. Uh, you know, some problems might ask you to calculate a heat transfer rate, but generally speaking, we assume the compressors are adiabatic, means they're just well insulated, which is probably not a bad assumption at all. Um, and then through the expansion valve, it's throttling and kinetic potential energy we throw away typically. Unless your instructor is really mean that day and wants to make you include it. Okay, so um, the energy mass balances just results into uh, per unit mass flowing, the heat transfer and the evaporator, just the enthalpy difference. Um, and that, and again, Q dot N is the reason to run the cycle. So that's the capacity, and that's either kW BTUs per hour or tons. And that goes back to the old unit, melting a ton of ice in 24 hours is 200 BTUs a minute. The, uh, heat diffusion of ice is typically taking 144 BTUs a pound to uh, melt it or freeze it. Uh, and, and of course, you, you have a definition there for the metric or the US system of units. Um, <clears throat> So assuming that we don't, we're not taking uh, heat transfer into account at the compressor, then the, the work per unit mass is just the enthalpy difference. Condenser, heat transfer out per unit mass is the enthalpy difference. I mean, the, you know, this is, this is pretty simple once you just kind of get it in your mind. Uh, throttling uh, process is constant enthalpy. That's our favorite process because it's just H in is H out. There you go. Performance parameters, coefficient of performance, we use beta for the refrigeration cycle, which is the desired output or desired reason for running the cycle, which is the heat transfer into the evaporator uh, per unit mass divided by the compressor work per unit mass. So in terms of enthalpies, uh, just the enthalpy uh, in and out across the evaporator and out and in across the compressor, just to write those as positive terms. Uh, and so that, that top equation 107 is what you would use for an actual, you know, if, you, uh, if you're given state points and all that, you go find the enthalpies. Um, if you're, if for Carnot, then we only care about the temperatures really. And so TC would be the temperature of the house and TH would be the temperature of the ambient that we're dumping the heat to. So a lot of these problems will give you some operational data and you calculate the real coefficient of performance and then you calculate the Carnot coefficient of performance and you compare the two and just says, oh wow, that's not near as good as the Carnot. <laughs> well, that's right, it's not. Um, <clears throat> because we know the Carnot is the maximum theoretical, uh, the best coefficient of performance, you know, giving a TH and a TC. Okay, so uh, heat transfers between refrigerant and uh, cold and warm regions are not reversible because we have to have a delta T. You know, for example, you know, if we're going to, if, if this is the outside temperature, say that's a hundred, just say it's a hot day, it's a hundred degrees. Well, that refrigerant's gonna to have to be 150 or something in order to be able to transfer the heat effectively without having a super large component. So, and the bigger the delta T is, the more irreversible it is. So that's how the second law. And likewise, if we're gonna maintain the house at 70, then the refrigerant's gonna to have to be, you know, 38, 39, 40 uh, in order to produce cold enough air to you know, counteract, uh, absorb all the heat that's coming in. So these are the temperatures that we're maintaining, TC, and this is the temperature that we're dumping the energy to, but this is the refrigerant temperature on the high side, and this is the refrigerant temperature on the low side to make all of this work. And that's, abs that's absolutely not reversible. Uh, an evaporator is less than TC. I just said that, probably 37, 38. Well, he's going to pound it in. In the condenser, it's much greater, probably 150, 160 as we condense. 
And so the irreversible heat transfers have negative effect on performance. So, you know, if, if you're trying to optimize these things, you know, well, okay, yeah, I can not compress to as high a pressure and temperature and put twice the size of condenser. Now, as a customer, would you rather pay an extra $700 for your air conditioning unit to get an oversized condenser so that it will be more efficient? Say so that's the game that they play. And so the manufacturers put out several different models. You know, they may put out the standard model, um, you know, which may have a COP of four and a half. And then they put one that's $1,500 more for the same size, and it's got a COP of five and a quarter. And that's going to save you money over the long haul, but you got to buck up on the front end. And so, you know, do you want to do that? And the manufacturer's got to figure out, well, he's got to sell enough of these things to stay in business. So that's kind of the way the game gets played. Okay. Um, COP decreases primarily due to increasing compressor work input as um, the temperature of refrigerant passing through the evaporator is reduced relative to the temperature in the cold region. So as we go down, and of course as we go down then the evaporator can get smaller and the temperature of the refrigerant passing through the condenser is increased. So, I think we've kind of pounded this home pretty good. Um, irreversibilities during the compression process are suggested by the dash line from state one to state two. And so this is showing the entropy increase. If we had the, uh, the ideal compressor that was isentropic, adiabatic reversible, it goes straight up just like the turbine went straight down. But the real one um, has to bend over to the uh, right a uh, little bit, showing the entropy increase. And of course, see the temperature goes up. Uh, and of course, that's an ISO bar. That's the same pressure. But um, because of the irreversibilities, we get more temperature out of it. Uh, An increase in specific entropy. Yeah, I think I've said all that. Uh, uh, the work input for compression process 1, 2 is greater than the counterpart one, two is. So there we go. The ideal one's the red one and the real one is the blue one. Uh, since process four one and this refrigeration capacity is the same, because see here's our refrigeration effect. This is our two phase coming out of the expansion valve. We're gonna evaporate that uh, and come out here. So we have exactly the same capacity and so the one that goes straight up has less work input, so it'll have a, uh, a better COP than the one that has the irreversibility in the compressor. All makes sense. Uh, breaking it down to look at the, the enthalpy definitions for the isentropic compressor uh, efficiency of the compressor. We know it's a comparison of a real device to an ideal device. We put the ideal device in the numerator because it's smaller and the real device is gonna require more work. So it goes in the denominator and we simply plug in the enthalpy definitions. So I think that's pretty straightforward. Work required for the isentropic compression, that's that line. Work required by the actual and that's the dash line. Uh, we've got an example here, I think, I did this before and it's pretty straightforward, so I think I'm gonna let you all read through that. I wanna get through to some new material here. Okay, this the pH diagram instead of a TS diagram, um, what it looks like. So, you know, here's our uh, low pressure, here's our high pressure, so there's our compression process. Uh, this would be a line of constant entropy. This would be one that shows the entropy increasing. And then of course we have to condense over to three, shows it slightly subcooled. And then we expand um, through the expansion valve, which is just a vertical downward line on a pH diagram. And then we go through the evaporator and evaporate it away around the cycle. So that's pretty good. 
Okay, refrigerant uh, selection, process, and all that. I think I'll let you all read through this. There's a good uh, section in your textbook about this. We went through this before. All the different refrigerants that are out there. Uh, they have water on here. Water is actually a refrigerant too. I don't see it listed. It's got its own number. Uh, CO2 is a refrigerant. We'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about water too here in a minute. Uh, GWP's global warming potential. And so the base gas is carbon dioxide. It's, it's arbitrarily assigned a GWP of one. And then all these other gases are rated based on how much they cause warming in the atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide. So you see back in the old days, anybody got a can of R12 on the shelf? If you're a antique car buff, you know, you can still buy them. Get on eBay if you want to have some fun and see what a pound of R12 cost you. Yeah, somebody wants to get on there. Say, I, I, now I haven't looked lately. It used to be on there. It used to be like five hundred dollars, something like that. Because I mean, they quit making it a long time ago, but it used to be that it was still available. So I'm gonna, so I'm getting checked here. So let's see what the number comes back if it's, uh, if it's still available. But you can see, I mean, look at the global warming potential, and that's back when the, we were eating a hole in the ozone layer, and we were all gonna die of skin cancer and all that stuff. And so they outlawed R12, which was probably a good thing to do. These chlorofluorocarbons are, uh, that's this, the CFCs are pretty potent in terms of that. And so they come up with new refrigerants and all that sort of thing. Um, look at ammonia. Ammonia has a GWP of one. Why don't we all, and it's a great refrigerant, why don't we all just load up on ammonia? It will kill you. <laughs> Okay, okay, so it's not as expensive as I thought, but it, but anyway, so $70 for what, what, what the standard little can that you'd buy at the auto parts place, you know. So you can probably buy the, what, the R134A for what, six bucks, something like that, five bucks, if y'all, I do that a little bit, you know. I used to put in my own auto refrigerant, but you know, if you overfill them, it kind of causes some problems and I've overfilled one or two. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of quit doing that, but, but it's real easy to do. Just buy your little kit. Make sure you find the suction side of the compressor, not the discharge side. <laughs> that, that, that would be a bad day, but other than that. But anyway, that's global warming potentials. Uh, different characteristics. I'm not going to go back through this for you. Okay, so let's start with absorption. So this is kind of a whole different technology. So it, it shares some pieces with vapor compression, but it has a lot of differences. Okay, and um, this is something that in my consulting practice, I sometimes recommend to people that they look at this. Okay, and so you guys definitely need to know what absorption <laughs> refrigeration is at least at a high level. Um, okay, and so there's the cycle. And so you see the vertical dashed line. So everything to the left of the dashed line is common to a vapor compression cycle. We got a condenser, we got an expansion valve, and we got an evaporator. And so all you got is your refrigerant flowing through those things. Condenser condenses it, and it's at a high pressure on the you know, top side of the cycle, goes through the expansion valve, gets cold, gets low pressure, a little bit of it flashes, goes in the evaporator, evaporates away, pulls heat out of the house or whatever we're trying to cool, and then it goes across the dotted line. So in absorption, you don't just have one working fluid. Well, I guess you have one working fluid, but you have two fluids. And, and so this, he's talking about an ammonia water system. Uh, ammonia is the refrigerant and water is like the carrier fluid. And so these things combine when you get on the right side of the dotted line, they, they get together and they work together in order to uh, basically provide the compression process, which is not just a straight uh, vapor compression, okay? Um, there's also, so ammonia 
is what's used for really low temperature refrigerant. Like if you go to work for a commercial food place and they got flash freezers and, and they're processing a lot of food, they're gonna be doing ammonia-based refrigerant. They don't care if you die, <laughs> no, they, they care, but they're real careful with it. And they have a lot of process and plant and not that many people and they put alarms and they're real careful hopefully that they don't kill anybody because ammonia is pretty bad stuff if you, if you have to breathe it. Uh, but uh, for regular air conditioning, we actually have um, water lithium bromide and water is the refrigerant, pretty interesting. So probably the majority of absorption systems, water is the refrigerant and lithium bromide is the carrier fluid. And your author mentions that a little bit, but not too much. Okay, so let's looking at the diagram at one, we've got uh, what we've got uh, low temperature, low pressure, probably slightly superheated vapor because we boiled it off in the evaporator and we put it over to the absorber. Well, it goes in the absorber and it physically mixes with, so that would be the ammonia vapor mixes with liquid water and they get together and water and ammonia just love each other. And they just kind of go into solution, you know? Ah, feels so good, where have you been? You know, the ammonia has been missing you all the way around the cycle, you know? I mean, it's not that you get all of it out at the generator, but you get a lot of it. You get enough of it for it to work. So they get together. When they get together, it's exothermic. They give off heat, you know? And so that's what that cooling water flow down at the bottom um, absorber coolant is about. If you don't, if you don't pump it, and that's typically cooling tower water, you just pump it through there from the cooling tower, and it keeps the temperature under control in the absorber. Otherwise, it's going to grow and grow and grow because as that reaction takes place, that ammonia water goes into solution, it gives off heat. We got to dump the heat someplace. Okay. So then coming out at the absorber at A, we call that then strong solution. And that means that it's strong in terms of the concentration of ammonia in water. That's the maximum concentration where, because we got it all put together coming out of the absorber. Well, that goes into a pump. And so this pump provides the pressure increase. And the pressure increase is not as great in a vapor compression cycle, but I mean, it, it, it still requires a high and a low pressure. Well, that's a liquid that you're squeezing on, and it doesn't take much energy to raise pressure on a liquid compared to a vapor. So that's the big advantage to this, potentially, is that it doesn't require very much. The pump work is very, very small compared to the compressor work that we'd have on a vapor compression cycle. Okay, so that strong solution is now coming out of the pump and it goes up to the generator. Well, to make this cycle work, we've got to then separate a bunch of that ammonia from the water. We gotta get it out in the pure vapor state so that it can then go to the condenser and feed the other components in the cycle. Well, how do we do that? <clears throat> we provide some, it says high temperature source. You can get by with 200 Fahrenheit. You can actually run these things at 180 Fahrenheit if it's a single stage. And in the real world of absorption, you have single stage and double stage uh, systems. The double stage requires probably 350, 370 uh, degrees Fahrenheit to work. The single stage, you can run, you know, the stated temperature is probably 220, but you can get them to run down about maybe 180. Well, so then the question becomes, ah, where are we gonna get the heat? So if you're in a plant, a lot of times you have waste heat. You have processes, you have furnaces that you know, are cooking, curing, whatever, and you have waste heat coming out of the ovens and you also need refrigeration. Well, that's a great opportunity. If you've got you know, 300 degree stat gas, that could be coming out of, come off a boiler. You could recover some of that heat and put it into this absorption unit and I mean, require almost no purchased energy. The amount of electricity is very small. You would have to purchase that. But the biggest by far energy input is the heat 
uh, that gets transferred into the generator to boil off that ammonia or refrigerant and send it to the condenser. Okay, so once we've boiled that off, and we don't get all of it, I mean, there's still a significant amount of ammonia that stays uh, in the water or the carrier fluid. But then once we've boiled off, then we call it weak solution because we don't have as much as we had before. So coming out of the absorber, it's strong solution. Coming out of the generator, it's weak solution. And then since this is high pressure and this is low pressure, we don't have to pump it. We just put a pipe and a valve and it flows based on this delta P back to the absorber. So the, uh, the, the water in this system just goes around in a circle over here and then the ammonia gets generated. Uh, the vapor gets boiled off and goes to the condenser. So we only have ammonia on the left-hand side. It comes back and mixes in the absorber. And so the water stays over here and then the ammonia gets to, to go by itself over through the rest of the refrigeration cycle. So that's, that's what's going on with the absorption. Now that's my take on it. Now we'll go through the slides. That's kind of the way I like to do this, tell you my version and then we'll go see what the author has to say, see if we agree. Okay, so the left side of the schematic includes uh, components familiar from the discussion of vapor compression, evaporator, condenser, and expansion valve. Only ammonia flows through those components. And if anybody has a question or anything, feel free to jump in. Okay, so I think that's pretty clear. Then the right side of the schematic includes the components that replace the compressor. So see, it takes all of those gizmos and that heat source to replace that compressor on the vapor compression cycle. I mean, that's what we're doing. So for a given capacity, these things cost more, right? Because look at all the crap you gotta buy, whereas you just bought a compressor before. But if your high temperature uh, heat transfer into the generator is free energy, Ah, oh, then we may have something going on here that's worth looking at, okay. And there's some other reasons that we'll talk about. I don't know if we'll get there today, but there's some other reasons too. So, okay, compressor, uh, these components involve uh, liquid ammonia water solutions. Okay, principal advantage of the absorption system is that for, uh, comparable refrigeration duty, the pump work input required is much less than for the compressor of a vapor compression system. So you need to know that. The big advantage is electrically speaking, we're putting far less energy into this thing. Specifically in the absorption system, ammonia vapor coming from the evaporator uh, is absorbed in liquid water uh, to form uh, an ammonia water solution that's in the absorber down here. Oh, oh, oh yeah, forgot about this. Cool. So we're even, we got to go back and do that again. Whoops, hitting the wrong button. There we go. So, so we got blue and green, and we turn kind of aqua there once we get them together. Okay, uh, liquid solution is then pumped to the higher operating pressure uh, for the same pressure range, significantly less work is required. We've said that umpteen times. So there we go. Now we're pumping up to the high pressure, our strong solution. Uh, however, since only the, the Ammonia vapor is allowed to go on the other side of the cycle. So we've got to get it out. And so we're gonna boil it. We're gonna use a generator and a high, fairly high temperature source. And they split apart again, the ammonia goes around, the water goes down and there we go. So uh, steam or waste heat that otherwise might go unused uh, can be a cost effective choice for the heat transfer in uh, in, into the generator. Alternatively, heat transfer can be provided by solar thermal energy. Yeah, I mean, if you wanna go invest in a bunch of solar collectors, uh, you can drive this stuff with hot water. I mean, you, you can just get them with a heat exchanger on them 
and uh, you put whatever hot fluid that you got in there. Uh, burning natural gas or other combustibles in other ways. So you just got to generate some heat and be able to couple it into uh, the heat exchangers on the device. Uh, you can buy these things um, that will combust natural gas directly. And then not only will they provide chilled water for air conditioning or cooling, you can get hot water, you can recover some additional heat from the flue gases and also provide a limited amount of hot water from that uh, combustion process as well. So that can be a good option. Okay, now, there we go. So uh, this is a slide I put in. Uh, this figure is in your book. He didn't have it uh, in the slide. So this is, um, we've added a couple of components here that you get with a real device. And so the first would be this heat exchanger. And so you see what happens. This uh, weak solution coming out of this generator is hot. I mean, this thing in a single effect, this thing is gonna be probably 190, 195 degrees, something like that. And you're gonna dump that into this absorber and then you're gonna have to cool it. So what a good idea. Why don't we pre-cool this stuff before we dump it into the absorber? And likewise, this strong solution coming out of the absorber, I'm gonna put it in the generator and heat it up in order to boil off the refrigerant. Well, that looks like we got a match made in heaven. We got one strain that we wanna heat up and one strain we wanna cool down. So we just put a heat exchanger in. So every absorption unit that you buy is gonna have this heat exchanger in it. It's just, it's a no brainer. It's well worth the money. So that's what this is about. Just, and it, it, it helps the efficiency of it. You don't have to put as much heat in here because you've already warmed this stuff up before you put it in. And then the rectifier, this is just a way to make sure that we don't get any water carryover into the condenser, into this side of the system. So if, we, if ammonia is the refrigerant, then we don't want any water carrying over. And so there's different ways to build this just to make sure we strip out all the water droplets and they don't come across. Because if this is, a, ammonia systems are typically very cold. It could, be, it could be below zero. And if you get any water across here, once you get below to 32, you have a bit of a problem, don't you? It's called ice, you know, and it'll stop up your system. So those rectifiers have to be pretty good. Okay, all right, so enough of absorption for right now. Let's move on to vapor compression uh, heat pump systems. And so, well, it's, it's basically the same components. We just maybe rearrange the uh, condenser and the evaporator a little bit, but uh, it's the objective, you know, if you put, if you got a heat pump at home, like last night it was got down to 34 or something. We cut it back, but now I don't have a, well, I do have a heat pump upstairs and downstairs is gas, but uh, I'm sure that heat pump was ginning away trying to keep the upper floor of the house from getting just too cold. So the objective is to maintain uh, the temperature of a space or a process above the temperature um, of the surroundings. So it's cold outside, we wanna keep the inside of the house warm. And so now on the air conditioner, it was Q dot N, it was the energy that went into the evaporator was the purpose to run the cycle because we wanted, because this was in the house and this was outside the house. Now we've kind of changed the location of these things. And so now the purpose of running the cycle is to get Q dot out into the house and Q dot in is being pulled out of the cold air outside. So it changes the, uh, our equations just a little bit for uh, CLPs and stuff. Um, principal control volumes uh, involve really the same components. We've got an evaporator, which is evaporating refrigerant. We've got a compressor, which is taking um, low pressure uh, saturated or slightly superheated vapor and compressing it to a high pressure, high temperature, superheated vapor. Uh, a condenser, which is 
uh, going to take that hot gas um, out of the compressor and condense it. And we're going to reject heat, which in this case we're going to put in the house. That's where the heat comes from. And then we have an expansion valve to make the whole thing work, the drop pressure, to make it cold enough that we can suck up some heat from the outside, which might be 34 degrees last night. Okay, performance parameters. Okay, so notice on the coefficient of performance for the air conditioning system, we had Q dot in, which was the evaporator heat flow. For the heat pump, we have Q dot out per unit mass. And it both are divided by the compressor work input per unit mass. So that's what changes. That's why we don't use beta. We use a little gamma so that we try to not get confused between those. And so that the, the 1010 would be for a real cycle. And then 10.9 uh, would be for the Carnot uh, coefficient of performance given a uh, temperature uh, inside the house, the, the TH, and then the TC would be the temperature outside, which is the source of the energy that we're pulling in to the heat pump. Um, and again, represents the maximum theoretical COP for any heat pump cycle operating between those same uh, hot and cold regions defined by TC and TH respectively. And don't forget to use absolute temperature when you evaluate those. Okay, method of analysis, you know, it's, it's basically the same thing. So we're, we're gonna take a look at an example problem here. Um, a vapor compression heat pump cycle with R134A as a working fluid maintains a building at 20 degrees C when the outside air temperature is five degrees C. Uh, refrigerant mass flow rate 0 0.086 kilograms a second. Additionally, additional steady state operating data are provided in the table. Real nice. He's gonna not make us look up the enthalpies, <laughs> which is real nice of them. Um, but make sure that you do know how to look up the enthalpies. Uh, determine the compressor power in KW, heat transfer rate provided to the building in KW and the coefficient of performance. So standard stuff. So compressor power is just the mass flow rate times the enthalpy difference. And, you know, we typically just write, at this point, we write these things as positive. You know, I mean, you got to you got to realize if you're going to throw things into a first law of balance, you have to realize whether the work that you put in is plus or minus based on the definition. But if you're just calculating a compressor work number, even though this is going into the working fluid, so strictly speaking, this is a negative. But there's no point in writing a negative up here. So they just writing all this stuff as positive. So I mean, it's just plugging in the numbers. Um, the mass flow rate times the enthalpy out minus enthalpy in. And so we get 2.4 kW. Uh, the heat transfer rate provided to the building is, well, it's the mass flow rate times uh, H2 minus H3. And so you can see H2 is the superheated vapor at high pressure coming out of the compressor. And H3 is should be condensed, should be like a saturated or subcooled liquid coming out of the condenser. And so we plug those numbers in. And we can tell it does look like that, uh, you know, that this has condensed. That's a pretty good difference. Looks like a phase change going on. And so that's 15.4 kW. And the coefficient of performance is just the ratio cooling effect out divided by the work input rate. And we get 6.4, which is pretty good. It's probably not true, but probably just a hokey that problem. Um, so then we can check the maximum theoretical coefficient performance for any heat pump. We just plug our numbers in and we get 19.5. So 6.4 even looks pretty good to me. I hate pumps usually my experience are not quite that good. But I mean, you see how much irreversibility there is. 
when you when you get 6.4 and you don't even believe it, and then you look at the maximum theoretical and you get 19.5, you know, good gum, these guys aren't doing a very good job. <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of irreversibility, especially in the heat transfer here. Okay, let's look at uh, Brayton cycle refrigeration. So on uh, the vapor compression stuff, we've got uh, we've got phase changes going on. Okay, Brayton cycle, we stay in the gaseous state throughout. So it's like air can be the refrigerant or some, some gas that's not going to condense. So Brayton cycle refrigeration is kind of the reverse of the Brayton cycle power, which the way we teach thermo at Tennessee Tech, you don't get the Brayton power cycle until next semester. So. Sorry, <laughs> but anyway, you get the Brayton refrigeration cycle here. So uh, the you know here's here's our components. Let's just uh, say well coming out of the turbine four is our cold state. Okay, um, this gas is uh, we're pulling energy out of the gas in the turbine. Uh, that turbine's producing work that's helping the compressor, and we can you can get cryogenic temperatures out of these things. This is how you make stuff really cold, really really cold. Okay, and so uh, it's coming out cold, and it's just a gas, and so we're coming out. The, so we're showing four or four S, you know. So if it's isentropic, it's going to drop straight. This is a TS diagram. It's going to drop straight down. Uh, if it's a real one, we're going to have some entropy increase. And this is, con you know, we're assuming constant pressure through the heat exchangers. You know. So <clears throat> wherever, that, that, that's your coldest temperature where you come out at four, whichever one where you're starting. You go through the heat exchanger and we go up at constant pressure. And this would be like an ideal gas or, you know, polytropic or something. But on a, on a, on a TS, that's constant temperature. Um, up to state one, and you see state one is a little bit lower than uh, TC because that's the temperature that we're trying to maintain here. So you can't get it, you can't get it all the way up to it. If you get beyond it, you'll start heating it back up again. So you don't, sure don't want to do that. So this usually stops a little bit short of the temperature in the cold region. And then we're going to go into the compressor. And so, uh, Again, so this was the turbine expansion over here, and this is the compressor. And so again, if it's isentropic, you go straight up. If it's not isentropic, you bend over a little bit, but this is a line of constant pressure. This is the high pressure, and we come out here. Um, <clears throat> so from one to two is the compression process. And then uh, where we have a heat exchanger, where we're gonna dump as much heat as possible because we want to get this as cold as we can at four. So we want to make it as cold as we can at three going into the turbine. Uh, and so we get as close to uh, TH as possible, the temperature that we're rejecting the heat to. And then we go through the turbine where we pull work out and we really cool that gas down. Okay, so, um, anyway. Okay, so now <clears throat> we'll go through his <clears throat> slides on this. Uh, let's see, process one to two. Uh, he's going to do the compressor first. The refrigerant gas, uh, which may be air, enters the compressor at state one, is compressed to state two. And we get the little blue ball. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, process two to three, the gas is cooled by heat transfer to a warm region at TH. Because we come out of that compressor, we've got some, we got some pretty serious temperature. So we can reject heat from the gas easily to the surroundings that we're gonna go through. We've rejected heat, we've cooled back down the gas expands through a turbine to state four where the temperature T4 is well below TC. 
we can get it really cold with the turbine. And then we're gonna, the refrigeration effect is from four to one, where we take that really cold uh, gas out of the turbine and we heat it up again and pull heat out of that cold region at TC. Bingo, that's the Brayton cycle. Uh, work developed by the turbine assist in driving the compressor. That's right. So you have the work input to the turbine. I'm sorry, the work input to the compressor minus the work input to the turbine because the turbine's helping the compressor. So the difference between those is the net uh, work input to the cycle. Okay, so if uh, we want to look at coefficient of performance, so this is refrigeration, so it's Q dot N is the reason for running the cycle. So Q dot N uh, per unit mass is just H1 minus H4. And then the compressor work per unit mass is H2 minus H1. And the turbine work produced is per unit mass is H3 minus H4. So. Go find your enthalpies, plug them in, have a big time. <laughs> I mean. Okay, let's see, we'll just power on through here. We'll have two classes to play around with problems pretty much. Okay, so automotive air conditioning using carbon dioxide. Why do we want to use carbon dioxide? GWP equals one. Now we could use ammonia. <laughs> you like to be locked up in that car when you get a good refrigerator, get ammonia leak. Uh, they're not going to do that. Because see, the GWP of ammonia is zero. Come on, boys. <laughs> Step up. <laughs> no, they're not going to do that. They have to way too much liability involved. So that's the that's the lawyer effect, you know. They don't want to. They don't want to get in court versus those lawyers on something like that. Okay, so owing to its low GWP of one, carbon dioxide is uh, under consideration for use in automotive air conditioning systems. But we got to buy some more gizmos to make this work, and that's going to up the price of your automobile. And so the question is, are you willing to spend? another $500 on your new truck or maybe $1,000 on your new truck. So instead of what, how much are you going to spend for a truck when you get out of here? What, 50? <laughs> 50 and 90. Let, let's say you're, you're conservative. You're going to get a $60,000 truck. So would you consider, would it be attractive to you to spend $61,000 and be able to say that you're using CO2 as your refrigerant? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Let me see what it does to the payment, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I mean, I don't know. What, 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 what may happen, especially with the results of the election, is this stuff may get mandated somehow and forced down our throats, and then the price of automobiles just goes up. That's why I'm gonna drive my old automobile until it dies. And I have five automobiles. I have a fleet. <laughs> and the newest one is 2009. <laughs> and that's my wife's car. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only one that's subject to getting upgraded anytime in the near future or in the future. Anyway, okay, so let's take a look at this. Uh, schematic shows such a CO2 charge air conditioning system. It combines aspects of gas refrigeration and aspects of vapor compression refrigeration. Sounds complicated to me. Okay, the processes of this cycle are process one to two, CO2 vapor enters the compressor at one and it is compressed to state two. So we're gonna compress some CO2. Process two to three, CO2 vapor is then cooled to state three by heat transfer to the ambient at temperature TH. 
So you're driving down the highway and so you've got some, some of those, that heat exchange up in the front end of your car is a heat exchanger and you're dumping, that gas cooler is dumping uh, some of that heated compression, the temperature out of it to the atmosphere. Okay, I, I can grasp that. We come back around to three. And then from three to four, CO2 next passes through the interconnecting heat exchanger where it's further cooled to a temperature T4 less than TH. So we got to cool it off some more. So we've got this kind of heat exchanger going on in there. Okay, so we get through here. All right, and then process four to five, we have an expansion valve to state five where it is a two phase liquid vapor mixture with uh, T5 is less than TC. So we're gonna have uh, liquefied CO2. Now I'm not sure what the, you know, it depends on pressure, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I've never really looked at the, the saturation and the phase change tables for CO2, to be honest with you. I don't know if they're in the textbook. They might be, I don't know. But anyway, you'd have to dig up some uh, CO2 tables if you're actually going to work a problem with this. They probably are. I just haven't looked for them. Okay, so we're going to go through that expansion valve. So H4 is equal to H5. And as I drop to that low pressure, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to drop into a two-phase liquid vapor region. I'm inside the dome and the temperature, uh, that T5 has got to be cold compared to the temperature inside the car. So I'd say it's gotta be, you know, 40, 35, 40 degrees, something like that. It's gotta be pretty cold to be able to do any effective uh, cooling. So there we go, we went across the expansion valve. Uh, process five to six, as the CO2 passes through the evaporator, it is vaporized. So again, we're boiling off uh, saturated liquid uh, by heat transfer from the passenger cabin. That's where the cooling effect is. Bingo. And we're back around to six. And six to one, finally, CO2 vapor passes through the heat exchanger where its temperature is increased uh, to T1. So, you know, again, we've got, we've still got uh, cold, we got cold vapor at six and we're gonna, we're gonna have to heat it up again. So we're gonna pre-cool uh, the gases uh, out of the gas cooler before it goes to the expansion valve. So we're, we're moving some energy from that uh, stream three to four into one to six, six to one. Bingo. And here's what it looks like on a TS diagram. So let's look. Pretty cool. <clears throat> okay, so one to two is the compressor. And this looks like real, that looks like that's got a little slant on it. So we're showing a little entropy increase. So that looks like maybe real type data. And then we're gonna cool from two to three in the gas cooler. And then we're gonna go through the heat exchanger. We're gonna cool some more to four. And so that's not quite to the critical temperature. It's saying that the critical temperature is 88 Fahrenheit. So that's right up here on the top of the dome. So this might be 90, 95 something like that, okay? And then we're gonna go across that expansion valve and we're gonna drop into the dome, okay? And so you see here, I'm uh, certainly more liquid than vapor. And of course, these are not really to scale, so you'd have to work a real problem to see uh, how much vapor you really had. Probably not too much, I'd say five to 10% max. Uh, the rest of it's liquid. And then we go through the heat exchanger, the evaporator, and we boil it off at six. And then uh, we go through the uh, heat exchanger and we go from six to one. 
which for sure is going to help my compressor because at six I could still have some I have the danger of having some liquid droplets in there because it's right on the saturation line and the compressor is not going to like any liquid droplets so going from six to one gets me well out in superheat land and that protects my compressor so that's a good investment from there and there's that critical pressure and there's that critical temperature so there you go and then we see the ambient temperature is here so maybe you know that's you know 95 100 degrees maybe 100 110 for design i don't know um and so they show coming out at three not quite down to the ambient high temperature and then this is the temperature inside the cabin. You know, maybe you figure that 68, something like that. Just to make sure you got enough capacity to keep, some people want to be really cold. And so then we've got to get down here. <clears throat> we got to drop to a low enough pressure here that we get cold enough that we can transfer significant amounts of heat to this cabin at that design temperature of TC. So there you go. Automotive air conditioning using CO2. Okay, thermoelectric cooling. I think I'll save this for next time. These are some slides I put in. Um, let's just, uh, we've got, what do we got? We got a little time left. Yeah, let's pull up uh, an example problem or two and do that. Let me go back just to kind of do, 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 do. I think 10 2 was a reasonable, good problem to start with. Uh, all right, so uh, 10 2. Consider a Carnot vapor uh, refrigeration cycle with R134A as the working fluid. Cycle maintains a cold region at 40, pretty cold, uh, when the ambient temperature is 90. Uh, data at principal states in the cycle are given in the table, so they're gonna give us the enthalpies and entropies. Uh, states are numbered, we got a figure, uh, so we got the TS diagram. Determine the temperatures in the evaporator and condenser in degrees Rankine. Uh, Compressor turbine work, uh, and for the expansion valve, he, he put a turbine in here. You can do that. There are people that look at that. Uh, you can get, you know, it's, it's so the expansion valve is constant enthalpy, right? If you're the turbine, then you have a decrease in uh, enthalpy as you go across the turbine and you get a little bit of work that can supplement the compressor. Uh, you don't, in reality, you don't get enough work out of the turbine to justify the cost of the turbine. That's why nobody does it. But in the thermal book, hey, we can do anything we want to because you, you don't have to write an extra check to, to do the analysis. Uh, okay, so we want compressor turbine work, coefficient performance, coefficient performance for a Rankine cycle operating between the same two temperatures. Okay. All uh, right, so, and notice well, let's look at the state points. Uh, I need to make this smaller. Okay. So now notice, okay, look at the arrows on this thing. Now, if you're my student and you put those arrowheads going that direction, you're gonna get minus five. That's not the way it goes, right? I was looking at this. I said, oh, there's something funky here. What the way? Oh, crap. They got to go in the wrong direction around the cycle. Yeah. So the arrowheads are going the wrong direction. I apologize. I didn't draw the diagram. So, yeah. So we come out of the evaporator. We go into the compressor. We come out of the compressor to the condenser. Expansion valve, in this case, it's a turbine. And then back. So just it just goes the other direction. And so there's my hot reservoir at 90, and there's my cold reservoir at 40. Okay. Uh, let's see. There we go. And so there's the um, TS diagram. 
And so notice that uh, we are doing isentropic. Uh, this would be what the compressor and this is the turbine. They're straight up and down. If you look at the data table, they we've got the same uh, entropies. So this would be the compressor and this would be the turbine. But so they're assuming they're isentropic and we got the pressures. And so that's the picture, except the arrows go the wrong way. And that's the diagram. Compressor, condenser, turbine, evaporator, around and around, okay? Well, so for the first one, to see the temperatures, I mean, this is, in, this is coming across the dome. So these are saturation temperatures and you know the pressures. So you just have to go to the uh, tables you go to the saturation tables, look up uh, 40, and you see that's the saturation temperature at the low pressure down here is 2904. Convert to Rankin, I don't know why. Well, he wants Rankin because he's gonna use it in the Carnot formula here in a minute. And then so the condensing temperature is about 100, 100 and a half Fahrenheit. So that's pretty easy. Just looking up those temperatures. Uh, and so then uh, for the, the values for the compressor and the turbine, the compressor work required per unit mass is just the enthalpy difference. So we get 10.83 BTUs a pound. And so the turbine uh, produces 1.86. Say not much when well, it's ten percent of what the compressor needs, and I say it ain't worth it. Ain't worth fooling with. Okay, and then for the coefficient of performance, well, it's the cooling effect, which is uh, H one minus H four. If you go back, so in this case, uh, yeah, H one minus H four is correct because you'd have more energy over here than you would here. So that's writing it as a positive. And then it's the network. So that required by the uh, compressor minus that produced by the turbine. And so you get uh, 6.86 as your coefficient of performance. And then for the Carnot cycle, we just plug in TC and it's TC because it's a refrigeration. If it was a heat pump, it would be TH. Uh, up here, but this is TC over TH minus TC, and we get 10. So, you know, compared to Carnot, if this could actually operate there, which it can't because it's isentropic, we've assumed isentropic compressors and turbines, um, you know, that, that would be a pretty good comparison of 10 to what, almost seven. But that also tells you that it's not real data <laughs> on a real operating, uh, compressor. Uh, okay, let's try one more and then we'll call it quits. Let's look at 12. I thought 12 looked like it was a reasonably good problem. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so this one just adds uh, an isentropic efficiency uh, to the compressor. So we've got uh, 134A vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Uh, operating data are known, uh, refrigerant mass flow rate is given. So we wanna determine compressor power, refrigeration capacity, and coefficient of performance. So these things all kind of fall into a rhythm. I mean, you can get more components, but it's typically more of the same stuff. <clears throat> uh, okay, so the mass flow rate is seven kilograms per minute. Condenser or high pressure, uh, P3, P2, P3 is eight bar. We drop an expansion valve, we're gonna drop down to two bar, and then we're gonna compress up between them, okay? And so, this uh, three to four is just a throttling process. That's a line of constant enthalpy on the TS diagram. 
and then the one to two S would be the isentropic compression, and the one to two would be the real compression process. And the isentropic efficiency of the compressor is 0.8. So this is, this is kind of the standard problem where you have to uh, find an actual enthalpy at two. Okay, so let's see. He's, he's going off and uh, finding the uh, enthalpies here. So I guess in this problem, you actually had to look them up. So uh, let's see, P1 is, we're saying saturated vapor at two bar. So that should be a lookup and you can check this in the tables, 241.3 kilojoules per kilogram, and the entropy 0.9253 kilojoules per kilogram per degree K. Um, P2, so we have to do some interpolation to find this point 2S at eight bar interpolating, we get that uh, H2S is 269.92. And then we use this 80% isentropic efficiency in this relationship to calculate the actual H2. Because we know everything in here but H2. We know H1, we know H2S, and we know the 0.8 over here. So you just solve that for H2. And so the actual enthalpy, instead of being 269.92 for isentropic is 277.08 which is gonna require more work input, obviously. Um, state three, we're saying saturated liquid at eight bar, that should be an easy lookup for you. H3 is 93.42 kilojoules per kilogram. And state four is a throttling process, my favorite process because H4 is equal to H3 is 93.42. So there you go. Uh, pretty simple once you get the enthalpies. So the compressor work is the mass flow of seven kilograms per minute times that enthalpy difference. And then we're gonna, we're gonna get to uh, KW. So the minutes have to turn into seconds. So we divide by 60 and then, then I've got uh, what? Kilojoules per second, which is a KW. So that just changes the units, it's one over one over one, but so we got 4.17 kW for the compressor work. Refrigeration capacity, the seven kilograms per minute times the enthalpy difference. And now we're gonna to convert to tons. And uh, so we're gonna have, um, this is gonna be what kilojoules uh, per minute, but that's my conversion factor. 211 kilojoules per minute is one ton. So I divide by 211. And I get uh, 4.906 tons. And then my coefficient of performance is the cooling effect divided by the compressor work input. So he's just, he doesn't even show, he's just sticking the enthalpies in and he gets 4.13. So that, now that's, that's a realistic CLP. You can buy an air conditioner. In fact, you can buy them with better COPs than that. So that's kind of a realistic number. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, I think I'm gonna cut it off here. We'll get this posted and then we'll finish all of the slides. We're almost done. I've got a couple of extra. I've added a few things out of the textbook and I may add a few more. Uh, and then we'll talk through those and just work some more problems next time. So I hope everybody has a good day or good Thanksgiving. So uh, stay safe. Uh, we're not gonna have any more in-class meetings. Um, I think after we come back from Thanksgiving, you know, the, the supposedly the COVID risk is gonna be uh, increased. I think we've done pretty well at tech so far. So let's just don't push it. Most people are just watching online anyway. So I think we're just gonna do that. And I wish you guys the best. Uh, course evaluation is out there. Uh, so please do that if you haven't. Um, and uh, great Thanksgiving. Be safe. And uh, uh, we'll be on uh, next Tuesday.